afternoon and welcome to this talk, Building RESTful APIs with Symfony Components. My name is Victoria. I work at Limenius. There we build tailor-made projects for clients using mainly Symfony for the backend and React for the frontend. In most of the projects we build, there is a need for an API. Maybe because you want to serve the data to the front end or to the mobile apps or for some other uses that we will review later. We are very comfortable with the Symfony framework and today I would like to show you how with only a few Symfony components you can have a lot of help for building your API. And also which other tools do you have if do if you decide to use the whole framework. Okay. First of all, I'm going to start with a, an introduction answering a few questions that may arise from the title of the talk. The first of them is, why would I want my API to be RESTful, okay? So after some time reading a lot about REST and so on, some people, some, someone may think, okay, this is fine, but actually I can think of a better way of structuring an API. Why should I use REST? Is it that good? Or even you can think, okay, I've been reading a lot and apparently there are some very, or a few confusing and controversial points and I don't think this must, this must be so good if, if people are arguing so much about it, right? Well, those are fair thoughts in my opinion, but on the other hand, you have two very, at least two very powerful reasons for having your API RESTful. The first of them is that REST makes the most of the HTTP specification. That means that it makes the most of the best features <coughs> of HTTP. It's about headers, status codes, verbs, and this is something really, really good, okay? On the other hand, this, there is another very good reason, is that you will be using a common language, and you all know which are the advantages of that, to have a common language with the others. That and in the long run, it saves time, it makes your life easier. Okay, but even so, you can say, okay, but is it, is it really worth it, all this thing? You all have seen this, the three levels that you are supposed to reach and so on. Well, I think that you can follow a sane approach to REST, okay? It has also three levels, but they are different levels. The first one is, is learn the stuff that is commonly accepted, which is most of it. Learn all the things that everyone agrees on, okay? Like use nouns for the resources, use verb, HTTP verbs, uh, return mini meaningful status codes, and so on. Most of this stuff, okay, everyone agrees on it, and you need to really know how it works and, and use it. Second step is be aware that there are a few gray areas or controversial points, things like, uh, do I have to return the, uh, the created or updated resource? <laughs> Um, can I actually have two different URIs when I have two different representations? So these things, you can see people discussing them for a long time without actually knowing which one is better. Even experts. So for example, this second question, you can see Lucas Smith, which is the, the author of the Phosphorus Bundle, saying, no, you cannot, you cannot have two URIs for two different representations because, because that goes actually against the concept of rest, RESTful itself. But then you go somewhere else and you see the author of the concept and he says, well, I never said that you have to use content negotiation all the time. I never said that. And he's actually having different URIs in his site for uh, different representations. So what to do, actually? Well, what you can do in these cases is to choose a site. You can choose a site simply because you think it makes more sense, because, you, because your colleague thinks that it makes more sense, or if you don't know what to do, you can even flip a coin if you want. But the thing is, at the end, you have to choose a, a way of doing that thing and uh, stick to it. That's the really important thing to do, to be really, really, really consistent when building your API, all right? So if you want to summarize this, try to be civilized and be consistent. The first part is, is kind of optional. You can also get totally mad about defending your ideas if you want. But the second part is absolutely necessary. You need to be the 
cool, calm, and very, very consistent guy, even boring guy, when it comes to implement your API. All right? Well, second question. Why Symfony and REST? Why are we putting those two things together? This one is very simple to answer. REST is several things. It's a very strict definition. It's a, sometimes a battlefield. But it's a way to make the most of the of HTTP, OK? And Symfony, on the other hand, was also built with the very same idea. It was built totally around the HTTP specification. So this is why those two fit so well together, because do, both of them really love HTTP, OK? That's the answer. And third and last question regard, regarding the title, why Symfony components? Why are we talking about components and not, not just Symfony? As some of you may know, Symfony is two things. It's a full stack framework that you can use as just one thing, but it's also a set of independent components that you can, can use isolately in your own code. And then actually, many popular PHP projects are using already for some time. For example, these are some of the components, and Doctrine uses them, Propel as well, Silex, the micro framework, uses many of them, Drupal since version 8, I think, as well, Laravel 2. So these components have brought like kind of a bit of a standardization to the PHP community in the last years. Okay? So in this talk, we are going to see in detail these five components. HTTP Foundation, Serializer, Validator, Form, and Guard. The knowledge that you get from these components, you can apply it later in a few different situations. When you decide to use the whole framework, when you find these components in some other framework, or even when using some of them in your own code, or even developing your own framework, OK? Um, you cannot be interested in developing your own framework, but it is a very nice exercise to do, actually. And in this resource, you can See how could you do it. I, I did it, and it's very interesting because you, you actually learn what a framework has, which are the different parts. It's really, really good. Uh, uh, actually, in this um, repository, what we did was to put together the five components that we are going to see now. So if you want to check the whole code of some examples that going, I'm going to show you, and mostly if you want to see how to use those components isolately, you can check that repository. All right, let's see what do those guys actually do. Let's see. Uh, first of them is HTTP foundation. This one is going to be the foundation of our API, and it's going to provide a um, object-oriented layer for the HTTP specification. What does it mean? As you know, in PHP, the request is represented by a few global variables, and the response is generated by some functions. So with this component, this component is going to replace those variables and those functions with two nice objects, re response and request. OK? Let's see how are they. The request. We can create one of those using create from, from globals. This is similar to doing actually <laughs> this. We are just creating a request object based on our current PHP global variables, all right? The response. For creating a response, we have to pass three arguments, the content, the status code, and an array of headers, which is basically what we will need in our, uh, to send to a, uh, show in our API. All right. We have response and request. How can we create a post endpoint with that? The requirement is very simple. Whenever we send a post request there, we need to receive a 201 uh, status code in the response. OK, let's do that. We have the request. We create it from globals, uh, the code, the, the content. We do whatever we want to do in there with the data, per sys, whatever. This is not the interesting thing now. And then we build a response where we can very easily put the status codes the status code, and here two headers, content type and location, OK? Right. Uh, if you want a shortcut, you can also use JSON response that will set the content type and also encode to JSON. You will be saving one more line. It's even shorter. With only a few lines, you already have your endpoint. 
What about PSR7? Maybe some of you have heard of this. This is a standard that was approved two years ago. What happens with this? What is it about? The HTTP Foundation has helped in the way of standardizing this object-oriented layer in the PHP community. But since this standard was approved, this is a step farther in this direction. So very likely, Symfony 4, that which we uh, release in next November, it will embrace this standard. Until then, you can actually transform your HTTP foundation objects into objects that implement this standard, simply using this uh, Symfony Bridge, okay? It's quite simple. Using that, your objects will be um, using this uh, standard. And why would you want to do this? Well, if becoming more uh, standardized is not enough for you, was, well, by the way, you have a link here to read more about this if you want. If this is not enough for you, you can, for example, use middlewares if, if you are using this uh, standard, which are basically very thin loyal, the layers implementing some functionality, okay? For example, authentication or whatever. So everything that is moving towards reusing more code, don't do it the same thing many times, is good for you. So that's why I wanted to mention this. Okay, let's move into the next one. Serializer. The serializer is gonna be one of our best friends because he's going to help us creating the exact, exact representations that we want in our API. All this thing is about creating representations. So, with the serializer, you are going to be able to create representations from your objects and the other way around. How? If we didn't have this one, we should do something like this. If we want to update our object from the request, we will have to type something like this. So for each property, we need to type some code, and it's something that looks repetitive and tedious to do. In the, in the opposite direction, it's similar. It would be something like this. We will use our object to produce a response, okay? But this is all things that we don't like to do, because here we have three properties, but what if we have like 50 or something? We need uh, something easier, cleaner. So the serializer is helping with this. Instead of having to write all this, you just need to call it, please serialize um, this recipe, converting our job object into a JSON response, all right? And in the opposite direction, the serializing, you can simply do something similar. <laughs> uh, hey, serializer, please deserialize this, this content into uh, my recipe class. Uh, it comes from a JSON format, all right? Just one line if, uh, instead of lots of them. Okay, the schema of the serializer looks like this. It may seem a bit complicated and the, at the beginning, but it is not. Uh, you are basically, yeah, turning objects into some format and the other way around. You can see that this, there is something intermediate in there, this array. This is only because we are splitting the task in two. We have the encoders that take care of uh, transformations between arrays and JSON, for example, and then we have the normalizers that take care of this part of transforming between arrays and objects. Usually the heavy work is done by the normalizers, okay? So before being able to use it, we actually need to do some setup. We have to say which encoders are we going to use and which normalizers. In this case, we are saying, hey, we're going to use XML and JSON encoder, and we are going to use object normalizer. Object normalizer is uh, the most powerful normalizer, but you have others at the, out there. You can check the docu documentation for that. Instead of explaining things that you can check there, I want to um, focus on the main idea of all this. The main idea is your representations doesn't need and they are not the same thing that you have in your database. You actually need to make sure to show in your API exactly what you want to show the representations that you really need are useful for you. For example, imagine that you have this user, okay? But maybe, this is in your database, but maybe you want that this property is called username, and maybe you don't want to show the password, you want the email to be shown in the profile but not, not in the list, you, perhaps you can add, uh, want to add a prefix there, maybe there are some properties that you want to show in one version of the API but not in an, another version, or you have things like this and you want to turn them into normal uh, other properties. Okay, for doing all this, the serializer is going to help, okay? 
For ex it brings a set of tools, for example, uh, these two annotations. Max depth. Max depth uh, is simply saying, hey, please serialize, but just do it until one point, second level or, or third level. Because if you have one object that is related to another one, another one, another one, maybe you don't want to serialize all that. You only want the first two levels. This is very useful when you are working with large trees and also when you have circular references, OK? There is another interesting annotation here is are the groups. Groups are useful <coughs> to serialize a specific sets of properties. Let's see it with an example. In your end, uh, we are going to create a get endpoint, but we want it to uh, we want to receive only these properties, name and servings. So in our entity, we are going to set the groups saying, okay, all of them have the group detail, but only some of them have the group overview. All right, so when we serialize passing the group overview, we are going to get a representation only with those properties. This is really, really useful. All right, uh, another thing that you are going to do very often when working with a serializer is to um, write your own normalizers, okay? Remember that this is the part that uh, deals between the object and the arrays. For example, a very simple example is when you want to serialize attributes with different names. In this case, you will have to write something like this. This is a name converter interface that has two methods, normalize and denormalize. When you normalize, uh, you are going to add a prefix, and please, when you denormalize, remove this pref prefix. As you can imagine, with this, you can do whatever you want in this um, changing what you have in your representation. All right, that was about the serializer. Validator is our third best friend, because we have to make sure that what whatever goes to our database is meeting some constraints. We cannot leave that work to the database. We have to do it before. And the validator is the one that is going to help us with this. Okay, it provides, provides tools for this task. In this very simple example that is only validating a string, you can see what do you have in there. There are two things. There are constraints, which are simply the rule formulations, so where you are saying, hey, I want this to happen, and then you have the validators. That is where the actual logic is. If at some point you need to write your own, your own constraints and validators, you will have to put your logic in there, okay? But what happens when we want to validate more complex things, like objects, which is our case? So then the important thing is that the validator needs to know which constraints apply to each of the properties of, of the object, okay? You can do that with annotations, like here, which I find very handy, but if you prefer, you could do it with YML, XML, or whatever you want. The validator component comes with 50-something constraints, and of course, you can write your own if you want. All right, which is also really, really important here if the validator, validation is not passing, if, you, if, the, if the constraints are not being met, then you have to return some errors. In an API, it's as important to have a good validation as having a good handling of the errors. This is extremely important because otherwise the consumers of your API can get very angry about this. We will talk a bit more about this later. Now we are going to review the form component. You might think, why are we going to use a form component if there are no forms in here? Well, the thing is that dealing with the data that comes through an HTML form and dealing with the data that comes through your API are two quite similar things. We are going to use the form component to deserialize that data and validate, okay? Using this component has a few advantages. It has a very powerful serializer and also if you are not only building an API, but also having actual forms somewhere, you are going to save quite a bit of work reusing that code, all right? So it provides powerful validation and serialization. Okay, uh, in this resource, you can learn quite a bit about this. Actually, this whole uh, course of KNP University is very interesting, if you want to have a look. Um, what we are going to do with our form um, component is to create a put endpoint. Uh, we want simply that it returns a 200 code, all right? So we'll do something like this. 
First of all, I want to point out something. If you are using the components without the framework, of course, you will have to do more work. You will have to write more things. For example, things like this. You will have to create your form factory, add in the extension that validates, and so on. All these details, you can check them out in our uh, repository. Because here, I want to focus on what is most important from, from the components. In this case, uh, we are getting the request, the content, and we simply have to build our form and bind the data to it. So simply with that, you can now check if the form is valid or not. If it's valid, you will return the successful response and otherwise some errors. For example, this thing of serializing the form to return the errors also needs some work from your side. It's another thing that you can check in the full example, right? Now that we have created a put endpoint to uh, update a resource, it's a good moment to ask this question, because I didn't want to review all the rest, rest theory, but there are a few questions that is, is good to review from time to time. So is actually a post to create and a put to update? Well, that's the common no knowledge, OK? But it's not true. It's not true, but if, if you follow it, you will be kind of OK, right? But the whole truth is uh, you have to use put if those two are true. The operation is idempotent, which means it doesn't matter if you perform, perform it once or several times, it will have the same result. And second, the URI is the address of the resource that you are updating or creating. If those two are true, it's put. Otherwise, it's post. Actually, this is not one of the controversial areas that I was mentioning before. This is quite, this is quite clear. It's only that at the beginning, it's a bit difficult to remember it for some reason. And second question, a bit related to this, do I have to return the resource? All right, well, many say that you don't have to, but some clients will assume that you will do it. So it depends. Depends on who are you writing your API for. It's a bit up to you. But as always, choose and then be consistent with your choices. OK, final component, Guard. Guard is going to help us with the authentication. Actually, in Symfony, we have a more complex component, which is called security. It's really big, it's powerful, it's very flexible, but is really a bit too complex. So they decided to create this guard component, which is kind of quite new, um, to simplify this security. They have simplified it so much that actually you only have to implement this interface, guard authentication interface. It has seven methods that you can see here. They are very thin and simple methods. If you check out the documentation, you will see that they are very easy to understand and implement. Of course, Having this, you also have then to implement some mechanisms for authentication, JSON web tokens, OAuth, whatever you want. This is not saving you from that, but this is like making the work easier, preparing you for, for this. OK. At this point, with these five components, when you arrive here, what you find out is, well, uh, you will probably feel that you need more things, or you have been needing more things that you usually have in a real framework like, well, routine, even dispatcher, and all these things. So maybe it's a good time to ask if, what if we use the whole framework? So now I'm going to show you which other things would you have if you decide to use the whole framework. Let's see. How, what do we have with that? The framework uses all these components and a few more. And the thing is, uh, as you already know, a component is an independent library. But in Symfony, you also have bundles. Bundles are tied to the framework, right? Not like components. Usually, or sometimes, or often, you have the library plus a bundle that is basically integrating the library in the framework. So now I'm going to show you a few bundles that can be useful for your API if you use the whole framework. First of them is this JMS serializer. This one is an alternative to the serializer that we have already seen. Mm, I cannot tell you which one is best, because both are very, very good, but they are a bit different. This one is perhaps a bit easier to, to set up and start working with, with it. It comes with lots of annotations, and then there are a lot of things that you can do very easily, very, a lot of standard things that are very quick to do. The other one, the Symfony serializer, is more about uh, very often writing your own normalizers, which also gives you more flexibility. Then it depends a bit on 
what you want to do or what are you feeling more comfortable with. But both are very nice choices. Some cool things that this one has are three exclusion strategies. Apart from groups, you can exclude some strategies with annotations too. Versions, where you can say these properties are in this version of the API, these are not. You can have virtual <coughs> props, uh, events that provide extra flexibility. If you work with XML, it's very configurable. So you have a lot of cool things. Next bundle is the Fortress bundle. The Fortress bundle is not one tool, actually. It's more like a toolbox. So it provides a set of tools that are useful for building your API. I chose some of them, these are some of them, but basically it helps a lot when you have to deal with different representations of the resource, it has a body request decoder, um, it, ha it has a listener that performs content val um, negotiation deciding which format is the appropriate one. So those are a set of tools that if you don't know them, you can live without them, but actually the f when you start using this, you cannot picture yourself building an API without it somehow. So it is worth as well to have a look at it. The next one is going to allow us to have JSON web token authentication. We can use this together with the guard um, component that we already have seen. Uh, it's based on a couple of libraries that of course you could use without the bundle if you are not using the, the whole framework. Uh, what is this about this authentication in case you don't know? Well, it's basically that you send some credentials, username and password, to an endpoint that you have configured in your security, okay? And then with that, you will receive a token. And from that point, using that token, you will be able to uh, send requests, okay? It's as simple as that. It's a very simple way to, have, uh, authentic to, to be authenticated, okay? Which other choice you have? You could go for OAuth. In my personal experience, uh, that makes sense if you have a good reason for having OAuth in your project because it's quite a bit more complex. Many times with this is more than enough for your APIs. Okay, this bundle is going to allow us to reach level three, okay? Level three is about returning the links that um, make possible to discover, or to discover your API. All right, in case that you want to do this, uh, this bundle is going to help a lot because you are going to return instead of just this thing, the proper link, all right? And you are going to return the proper link in a very simple way because you have a, an annotation that and is taking care to generate the proper route. So you don't have to, of course, hard code your routes because you will get the proper ones with this, okay? Potentially allows you to reach level three. Do we want to reach level three? Well, theoretically, if you don't do it, your API is not restful. In the real world out there, not so many APIs are implementing it. So again, it depends on what you need and what you think is best for your API consumers and so on. You have to decide by yourself. Okay, and the last bundle I want to, man to mention is this Nelmio that is going to help with documenting. While you are coding, you will be writing some annotations that will, will uh, produce a very nice documentation. Why is this good? Because if you leave the documentation for later, you probably will never do it. But if you can do it while you are coding, it's much better, much better. It uses a lot of introspection. That means it, it's taking information from the code to output the documentation. It looks like this, there is an annotation, you put there some tags, and it produces something that looks like this, okay? This data has been just taken from the code. But it's easy to keep your documentation updated with something like this. Mm. All right, that were, that were the tools I wanted to show you, that you, some were components, and other were bundles, okay? And now I want to uh, take a moment to um, talk about testing, why? Because because testing is extremely important when you are building an API. Because you cannot be there in your browser trying it, you actually need some tools that make very comfortable to check out if what you are doing is right or not. It's, the, in, it's a case in which this you cannot avoid. You need, really need to do it, and you really need to have an environment you feel comfortable with. So, which things can you use? You can use Postman, it's the first thing you can use. This is 
um, okay if you want to show to someone, for example, hey, I have these endpoints, they are working, check them out here. But for yourself, you probably need to set up something, well, it looks like this. For yourself, you probably need to set up something a bit more powerful uh, that allow you to code some real test tests. These tools, this tool is very, very simple to use as well. Gazelle and PHP unit, okay? You will be uh, implementing, implementing functional tests that simply uh, let you check that your API is doing what you want it to do. One test could be simply, could be simply like this. Like with Gazelle, you can very easily send post requests and then print the response, that's all. So, another thing that we already mentioned is that it's very important to, important to handle proper, properly the errors. What do I mean with this? Imagine, for example, that you will be receiving something like this array. So it is, it is worth it to take some time to implement some code that saves you a lot of time with this. For example, to check if these errors, errors exist. Errors, children, servings, error, is it there or not? So whenever you find yourself checking things like in a not very comfortable way, it's because you are missing something that you should have coded. <laughs> so take your time to do these things. Another example, at some point you could receive an HTML error, which you shouldn't, but it can happen. So if you see this in your browser, it's okay, you can read it, but if you see this in your command line, it's really annoying. You will lose your eyes looking in there. So perhaps is it worth it to code something that can extract the uh, meaningful information, the title in this case. This doesn't take so much time and it will save you later a lot. If you can only see the things that you want to see in there. For example, with the Symfony crawler, you can do a simple tool like this. Okay, of course, it's basic to have an isolated database. Using SQLite is, is a good option because you lose less time dropping database and so on. And related to this is extremely, extremely important to have good fixtures for your tests. Good real fake data that looks like real. And these two tools, Alice and Faker, are very useful. Actually, we use those for not only for building APS, for every project. Is the, there are two different, completely different things to show a new project with mm, nice fixtures and to show one without. It doesn't, it's not the same thing at all. So this looks something like this. You can have fixtures with fixed values because maybe you want to check that they are like this or just generate a lot with generators. Uh, you have many, the Faker is providing a lot of generators that will be, that will actually build very, very uh, real looking fixtures. Okay, finally, I'd like to review, uh, well, a few cases of when can you need an API, but especially one. Of course, it's to serve uh, data to your front end or to your, your mobile apps. Also, when you can, you want to isolate one functionality, you may want to have an API to communi communicate with the rest of the system. But one use that we have found that is very interesting in the last year, it's sometimes to undertake a migration, okay? Imagine that you go to a company where they want to uh, undertake a migration, uh, changing, for example, a big legacy code from PHP to something like Symfony. So there are a few approaches that you can follow. The first of them is simply to start coding in the new framework and you keep replacing functional functionalities one root at a time and um, re replacing them with the old system, okay? So the symphony is in front of the legacy code and uh, step by step, at some point you can remove the old thing. If you want to learn, learn more about this, in this presentation, you have quite a lot of information. But this approach is very good when you have a team that knows quite a bit about the new technology. Because like the, the tough part, the hard work, is going to be done in the new language. The routing, the, all these things. So many times, actually, the, the team is not an expert in the new technolo uh, technology. They actually want to learn it. So there is a second approach that is more appropriate for these cases because the team, in these cases, is an expert in the legacy code. So what can you do? In those cases, you have your legacy code and you can start coding the new functionalities in Symfony and building an API with all the things that we have reviewed here. And then uh, the old system will, will be getting thinner and thinner 
while it replaces the calls to the API, right? Now, since the expert, the team is expert in this case in the legacy code, this approach is sometimes much more useful for them, okay? So this is a case in which we can apply all these things regarding APIs. At some point, of course, you can remove the legacy code by uh, front-end. Okay, just some final thoughts, thoughts to summarize what we have seen. We have seen why REST and Symfony fit so well together. It's because both of them were built thinking of the HTTP specification. Uh, we have seen how a few components can provide a lot and how you have more stuff if you want to use the whole framework. Also, we have seen that it is very important to set a proper test environment. But if you want to get only one idea, that, that's sometimes that's what we want to do, to have only one idea from this, uh, that would be that all these things of building nice APIs and um, doing things right is to sometimes finding a good balance between these two. Okay, you can fight for your ideas and say how good your API is, but the real work is to become this cool, calm, and also boring guy that is focusing in being, in being very, very, very consistent with his decisions in his API. And that, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions. Okay. If they don't have it, it's okay as well. <laughs> uh, one of the other arguments that I've seen with REST APIs before is about versioning. Um, where do you stand on that? Do you put version strings at the start, or do you put them as get variables afterwards? Sorry, or... I, I can't understand from here. Can, can you speak slowly, because there is some noise? And... Okay, I was wondering what your opinion was on versions of REST APIs. So do you prefer to put the version strings at the start or as get variables afterwards? Or I uh, know it's a hotly debated topic. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I don't have a, brand, a preference with that. It depends a lot as many times of what you want to do. So honestly, I don't have a preference, not really. Any other questions? Yep, there we go. Do you keep the form controllers separate from the API controllers, like the normal uh, HTTP twig? type pages separate from your API endpoints? Yeah, that's a good, a good question. Yes, we keep them separate, but of course, since you have to do your controllers very, very thin, that's not a very, a big, very big problem, because you will have two very thin controllers doing two similar things. But we actually, yes, we prefer to keep those separated. Something else? Um, do you write any ex acceptance tests around the um, API endpoints to ensure they're returning the right things? If we return, of course, that, that's a very important thing to do. You have to make sure all the time that you are returning the... the that's why I was talking about implementing some tools that really um, let you see what is coming from there. That's a very important thing to do, yeah. How do you feel about exception handling? Do you use exception listeners by using the kernel? Yes, exception listeners are, I didn't want to enter into much detail with that, but are one of the most powerful things to, to use. That's why, so you have those in the, one of the serializers, I think you have in both. It's very, very, very useful. We use it always, yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on the use of Swagger or the Open API standard? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask, but <laughs> I haven't used Swagger actually, so I cannot say. Sorry. What about um, JSON schema validation? 
Well, about JSON schema validation, you have a very good talk now in another, <laughs> in another. we use it quite a lot and it, it's, it's really interesting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what is your thoughts on things like, for example, using Fractal? Because if you use um, your serializer, you're basically sort of uh, putting what your database has into your response, but maybe you, there's a few things that you might want to do, like relationships uh, and using something like Fractal. What, what is your thoughts on that? Well, if you need that, of course, something like the serializer will help you with this. I have not needed that yet. Yeah, it's something that you can do with that realizer too. Okay. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. <laughs>